Deputy yeah. Speaker. Yeah. Diana Johnson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I think it's been an excellent debate that we're, we've had so far this afternoon with some very inspiring speeches about International Women's Day. I want to spend the time that I've got this afternoon doing some woman splaining. I want to take stock of how far we've come in gender equality, and I want to look back at some amazing, ordinary women who've achieved extraordinary changes in our society but have often been ignored or written out of history. So I want to tell you three stories. First of all, in July 1888, a strike took place. 1,400 matchwomen at the Bryant and Mays East End factory st went on strike against bullying, low pay and dangerous working conditions, which resulted in many of those women developing fossy jaw. The second story is about the June 1968 equal pay dispute by 187 women machinists at Fords in Dagenham. And my third story, also in 1968, is about the campaign by the Hessel Road Women's Committee in Hull, led by four great local women, Lily Balocca, Yvonne Blenkinsop, Mary Deness and Christine Jensen and they campaigned to improve safety at sea for trawlermen. Now, Hull in 1968 was one of the world's largest fishing ports, but there was a dark side to that industry. A trawlerman was 17 times more likely to die in an industrial accident at sea than the average worker. It was the most dangerous occupation on earth. 6,000 men had died at sea in the years before 1968, and when a further 58 trawlermen were lost on the St. Romanus, the Kingston Peridot, and the Ross Cleveland trawlers between January and February 1968, it became known as the Triple Trawler Disaster. And those lost were the husbands, the sons, the brothers, the uncles, and the nephews of the women in Hull. And as Lily Balocca, said after that triple trawler disaster enough is enough and she started a campaign to improve safety for their men folk now all of the the three stories that i've just mentioned of determined working women getting organized and taking a stand share three similar characteristics first of all all these women took action that shocked the society of their time and offended some. Each went against the view that women shouldn't have views of their own or the will to take action. And I have to say at this point that I was thinking of the, uh, the maxim, well-behaved women rarely make history. <laughs> so, in 1888, late Victorian England, match women were dismissed as little more than ignorant young women, largely of Irish immigrant stock, who were easily led astray by outside militant forces. And the 1968 Dagenham women machinists fought as much against the TGWU establishment of the time, tepid at best, in any support for equal pay, as much as they fought against the Detroit, Detroit bosses of Fords. And Hull's headscarf revolutionaries shocked the nation and knocked the Vietnam War off the front pages of newspapers with their 10,000 name petition, their local marches and their picketing of the dockside. They took the fight to Westminster and met Harold Wilson. They threatened to picket his private home if their demands to improve safety were not met. And they did this in the face of death threats, actual violence and insults from trawler owners and others. They were described as hysterical women, and they were told they shouldn't get involved in men's business. And this was, of course, all before social media. And we know now how uh, threats and insults are used to try and put women down and stop them uh, from standing up for the issues that they care about. Now, secondly, all these women achieved far more in a very short period of time than men supposedly campaigning for the same causes achieved over decades. So the 1888 bow strike lasted only around 14 days, but it won more progress than the men had achieved in decades before. And the ripple change throughout the wider labour movement was even more profound. 
from the match women's strike because the following year we had the 1889 dock strike in, dock strike in East London, spawning more politically active new unionism. And as such, I believe that the match women can be described as the founding mothers of the Labour Party. And the 1968 Ford Dagenham strike lasted just 21 days. And like the match women and the headscarf revolutionaries in Hull, they brought their case to Westminster and won. Resulting from this strike, Labour Secretary of State for Employment and Productivity, the wonderful, the marvellous Barbara Castle, introduced the 1970 Equal Pay Act. Mm -hmm. And although we all know in this House that the battle for equal pay goes on, the Dagenham women overturned decades of stalling on pay equality. And in Hull, as one of the headscarf revolutionaries, Mary Dinness, said, they had achieved more in six weeks than the politicians and trade unions have in years. Their campaign persuaded the government to adopt their demands in the Fishermen's Charter, which meant full crewing of ships, radio op operators on board every ship, improved weather forecasting, better training, more safety equipment and a mothership with medical facilities to accompany the fleet. These ordinary, yet extraordinary, Hull women led by Lily Balocca, a cod skinner on the docks, saved thousands of men's lives by their short campaign of direct action. And thirdly, all the victories won by these women were then obscured in the history books for decades and even written out. The 1888 Bow match women, though recognised by leading trade unionists at the time, were soon written out of history for the entire 20th century. Bow 1888 was downplayed in its significance. Many claim the strike was led by a, a more establishment figure, Annie Besant, who I think people would describe as the Polly Toynbee of her day. <laughs> and the real names of the strike leaders, Alice Francis, Kate Slater, Mary Driscoll, Jane Wakeling and Eliza Martin, were finally published in Louise Raw's brilliant book, uh, published in 2009, Striking a Light. And my honourable friend for West Ham first read those names out in Parliament in 2013. Now, the story of the 1968 Dagenham Ford uh, women slipped from view for decades until the 2010 film Made in Dagenham raised its profile again. And it is a delight that some of those original women have now seen the recognition they deserve in their lifetime. Now, I want to conclude by returning to the story in Hull of the headscarf revolutionaries. Now, events in, in 1968 in Hull did fade from popular culture, partly due to the post-Cod War decline of the local fishing industry, but also because of, frankly, some very outdated views about women in the city. And Lily Balocca, who led the headscarf revolutionaries, was sacked after the campaign, and she was blacklisted, told she would never work in the fishing industry again. She was out of work for two years, eventually finding work in a nightclub cloakroom. She died at the age of 59 in 1988, and there was no public recognition by the, peop by the people or the city of Hull of the pivotal role she had played in helping to protect the lives of and improve the safety of trawlermen. So, despite that huge victory for safer working conditions, before today, Lily Balocca's name has only ever been mentioned in this house once, on the 25th of March 1969, by James Johnson, no relation, a local Hull MP, and sadly, just in passing, no proper recognition or tribute to what she and those other women did. So it was great to see that the story of the headscarf revolutionaries was brought, brought back to life in Brian Lavery's 2015 book, The Headscarf Revolutionaries, and more recently the excellent BBC4 programme based on his book, as we mark this year the 50th anniversary of the triple trawler disaster. Now, very interestingly, <coughs> Hull has granted freedom of the city to many notable citizens over the years. But I have discovered that since 1885, when this honour could first be bestowed, out of 47 individual recipients, only two have ever been women. That's 45 men and only two women. And regrettably for the pioneering city of Hull, 
one of our most famous daughters, Amy Johnson, doesn't even make the list of her being uh, receiving freedom of the city. And in fact, the first woman who received freedom of the city of Hull uh, waited over 100 years for that to happen. So Janet Suzman, a, a wonderful anti-apartheid campaigner, received the award in 1987. And then we waited another 30 years before uh, Jean Bishop, um, who is uh, a lady in her 90s who's raised over £100,000 for Age UK, was given the honour of the freedom of the city just at the end of last year. So today, along with the other two Hull MPs, I'm calling on Hull City Council, Madam Deputy Speaker, to honour the leading women of the Hessel Road Women's Committee by making them all free women of Hull. Fifty years after that triple trawler disaster, Hull needs to proper, properly recognise these women. We've had wonderful theatre plays, we've got murals for the women in the city, but we need to make sure that they get the tribute they really deserve. And as the headscarf revolutionaries achieve changes in both uh, locally in the fishing industry but nationally in terms of health and safety practice, they should also, I believe, be recognised nationally too. And that's why all three Hull MPs are backing Ian Cuthbert's campaign for Yvonne Blenkinsop, sadly the only surviving member of the Headscarf Revolutionaries, to receive an honour. It's just not on for these wonderful heroines from Hull to be overlooked any longer. And in Lily Balocca's own words, enough is enough. Time to act now. Mary Robinson. Thank you, Madam Deputy Speaker. And I'm very grateful to be called uh, to, to speak in today's debate. And it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Lady, the Member for Kingston upon Hull North, and hear about the, the work that, honor, that uh, very ordinary women can do in changing the world. Um, it's a privilege to join Honourable and Right Honourable Members in celebrating the.